here to discuss uh, the Entrepreneur's Playbook, Lessons Learned from the Path from Inception to Exit, is uh, partner in uh, the corporate team at Burgess Salmon, Alex Lloyd. Alex. We're talking about risk, we're talking about doubt, right? That's what I'm talking about. Because paranoia is the key skill you want in your lawyer. <laughs> so, and also you can't really have a crescendo unless you have a low point. So just, let's reset expectations a bit. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the life cycle of a company from inception to exit. We're going to use a good example and we're going to use a bad example. So Headache Limited is the bad one. It's done everything to make its life difficult. Plain Sailing Limited, there's everything easy and it's plain sales, it makes life easy for itself. Rubbish names, I know, but I didn't have the creative juice for it. But what I'm really doing, I'm gonna say the same thing over and over again, and the crux of that is, you know, you've, you founders out there, you put all your blood, sweat, and tears into building something, something of value, and you wanna preserve that value. So complications, mistakes, and errors in the legals, they're creating doubts, they're creating questions, those doubts and questions are eroding that value you've created. So the crux of all of this, oh, well, slide doesn't work, but the crux of all of this, there should be a slide there, but the crux is simplicity and clarity in the legals means less questions, less doubt in the mind of the investors or the buyers, which means they're not focused on the risks and the problems with the business, they're focused on the story, on the growth, on the great pitch deck, and that means you preserve that value. And preserving that value gives you greater access to capital and eventually it'll give you a nice smooth exit. So we'll talk through the, the pink segment first, which is starting up, then we'll talk through the scaling up bit, and then we'll go on the purple bit, which is the, the path to exit, the final piece. And I, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be you know, fairly self-evident, right? but all of these things are real. We see them all the time. The same problems when we're looking at it from an investor point of view or a company point of view. The other thing to say before I start is, I've oversimplified everything, of course, and I've made it all black and white. But the truth is, things are complicated, compromises are everywhere, but this is just to illustrate principles. So we start with the founder team. As Graham was saying just now, on a commercial level, there's all sorts of reasons to have the right founder team. They're backing management, really, to deliver a plan, the investors, as much as they're backing the idea itself. And you don't want a team of technical wizards who can't run a business, and you don't want a team full of marketeers who don't have a product. But what I'm interested in here is just the practicalities of it. If you start with a founder team and you give somebody a load of equity, and then they leave, they're no longer contributing to the business. But unless you take those shares off them, they're sat there benefiting from the growth, but not contributing. But there's a question, how do you take those shares off them? If the company by that stage has started to develop and it's got some value, you've got to pay for those shares. Do you have the mechanism in place? What are the tax implications? Will the person want to get rid of their shares? So get the right founder team. Headache Limited didn't do it, and it's got this pain and complexity of trying to recycle that, those shares, that equity. Plain Sailing Limited did. That's the first one. Next one is the structure. So speaking really generally, simplicity is king again here. So a nice simple structure, single company, all the assets in one place, all the shareholders in one place, single class of shares, really understandable and familiar to any investor and anybody else. Headache Limited's got multiple companies, complicated structure, loads of share classes, and that's particularly problematic if it's trying to raise money from EIS or SEIS investors because the structure just won't qualify for those tax reliefs. So it's the same point again. Simplicity makes life easier. Then you're onto your seed round or your pre-seed round. So our plain sailing limited has done it very well. I mean, you, you want to do these things. They're really important. You need the money to get off the ground, obviously, but they're also a real drain on your time. You want them to go quickly and efficiently, and you want minimal strings attached, a nice, simple baseline. Because as you go on to raise more and more money, things are not going to get less complicated. They're always going to get more complicated. There'll be terms and strings layered on, on top of layers. So Headache Limited started off with a complicated structure. It's got a load of sh shareholders. Those shareholders have got a load of rights. They're restricting future fundraisings, maybe. They're rest restricting what you can do with the operation of the business. Plain sailing, on the other hand, nice and straightforward all the way through. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that early investors shouldn't have minority protections of some sort. I'm just saying 
be careful that you don't tie yourself in knots too soon. Next, IP. So you're saying my business is worth X, and part of that value, maybe a big part of that value, is in the intellectual property of the business. So the last thing you want is an investor to come along and say, well, I've got doubts about whether you actually own the crown jewels, whether Graham owns his designs, whether somebody else has developed the IP. So in our, in our bad example, it's not definitively clear that the, the assets that IP is vested in the company itself. Maybe they use some third party IP under a license, but that license badly documented, it could be terminated at any time. So there's no, there's no clarity about whether they can use the software that they need to use, for example. They haven't registered their trademarks, or they haven't done it in the right jurisdiction, so they haven't protected their brand. All the opposite true of plain sailing. The point being, as with all of this, if you've ascribed a value to that IP, it needs to be underpinned by something solid, and that's where the legals come in. If, you, if there are chinks in that, there are chinks in the, in the valuation. So that's starting up. Now we're on to scaling up. Incentivizing, so you're growing the team now. We're incentivizing the team. The, the obvious bit is to get the employment contracts right. You know, point obvious. You can't go back to an employee and start willy-nilly changing their employment contract later, so get a nice base and roll it out. But the bit where things go wrong quite often, and we see this all the time on exits, where somebody's tried to use equity, so they've set up a share option scheme of some sort, or they've used some sort of sweat equity arrangement comes to exit, comes to light that they've messed it up and the tax treatment's all wrong. The employee suddenly landed with a big income tax bill and is unhappy. The company's got a corresponding tax bill. The buyer's not going to pick up the, the cost of that. And that happens very often. So careful with share option plans. As you can see, our plain sailing one did it really easily, used a straightforward EMI option schemes, the most tax efficient scheme, put it in place properly with proper advice, no issues. Oh, I should go back, actually. The, what, what we see quite often, we did, had one the other day, was a startup, a really good startup. What they'd done, they were desperate to get people to work for them. And instead of setting up the scheme correctly, they were just saying, oh, I'll give you X number of shares for doing this piece of work. I'll give you Y number of shares for doing that piece of work. Ad hoc, done at different valuations, and that is just storing up all sorts of issues for both the employee, who's going to end up getting income tax, potentially, on the growth in those shares, and for the company. Contracting. Similar point as, as before, you've got a revenue stream, there's a value attached to that revenue stream that forms part of the valuation that the investors or the buyers have put on the business. If you've, got a, if you've got an undocumented or ad hoc set of contracts, when someone looks at them to see you know, what's really underpinning that value, and they find you know, the contract's terminable at will, or you haven't actually got a formal contract, or you're taking on a huge amount of risk under that contract, they've got doubt, they've got questions, and, they're, and it's eroding your value in the end. Governance. So at this stage, startups, and as you're scaling up, you, lots of companies really informal with their board processes, haven't put in place sort of the basic policies, you know, your data protection policies, your anti-bribery and corruption type policies. And as life goes on, you start to become scrutinized, and people are going to look at it. At the next round, particularly, they're going to look at it seriously. When you sell, they're going to look at it. And they very often find issues and risks. So for, start to formalize. And, and I know that make, turning a startup into a big corporate is not the goal. You don't want to make a load of bureaucracy and create treacle that you've got to wade through all the time. But people will look at this stuff, put a, put a basic governance structure in place. And then you're on to your next round. So you may have done a pre-seed, may have done a seed, may have even done a little bit more. And now you're looking at raising again. And the, the cardinal error that Headache Limited Bears has made is that it started too late on the process. It's running out of money at the very time it's trying to raise more money. So all the decisions it's taking about who the investors are, what terms it can accept, are taken under du financial duress, which can't, can't be a good thing. And I was, I was at a presentation the other day by an investment director at Octopus Ventures, and he was saying one in ten fundraisings come from a cold approach. So nine in ten, there's been some prior engagement with the investor somewhere along the line. So if you're not out there early engaging, you're, not, you're minimizing your chances of raising capital. So Graham doing his hundred pitches when he first raised 
money. He's come, he's, even if those VCs didn't invest because it was too early then, he's made some connections. His chances of taking money from those at some point in the future have vastly increased. So you, you can't rush. Next, wrong investors, right investors. So if you're a deep tech company, you've got a different universe of people who are going to be useful to you than if you're a manufacturing business, state the obvious. And the right investor can add value to your company more than just the finances themselves. And there's a, there's a bit of a mismatch there in the investment community, because on the one hand, all the VCs will say, you know, we add loads of value outside of just the money. We, we are, it's mentoring, it's support, it's portfolio company management. But something like 61% or 60-something percent of founders think that they're being underserved in terms of the value add given by VC. So choosing the right investor is really important. And I think there's also a, a disparity there between the female entrepreneurs value that value add services more highly. According to, this is according to this Octopus Ventures guy again, so don't quote me on it. So there may be a different set of investors for a different set of founders. So give yourself time to pick the right ones. Next thing is, it's really hard to raise money when your existing shareholders aren't happy with the process. They may, have, going back to my earlier point about your seed raise, if it's set up in a certain way, you might, they may even have a blocker. They may have a right to block that fundraising. But if not, they're still going to make it difficult if they're unhappy. So you've got to have a structured engagement with those existing shareholders. Now we're onto the path to exit bit. So we're now, the company's grown, we're established, and we're looking to prepare ourselves for sale. Maybe that you need to reorganize before you do that. You might want to hive out the bit of the company that you want to sell or hive out the bit that you want to retain. And if you're doing that, you want to do that early as well because if you imagine you're in the middle of a sale process, it's really demanding, it's emotionally demanding, it's time consuming. If you're trying to reorganize at the same time, you've got the buyer here looking over your shoulder while you're doing it. They're obviously really keen to make sure it's done correctly. They're part of their diligence. If you do that in a rush, while under pressure, you don't take the proper advice on it, and you end up with a, a bit of a mess, the buyer's going to look at that and think, well, I'm not taking on that risk. This is going to lead to a chip in the price or a, a significant contractual protection. Plain Sailing Limited does it early, has a tax structure paper from a nice tax advisor, has the legals all documented neatly, and then it packages it and presents to your buyer, oh, I've, do this is, I've done this, this is why, and here's a nice neat package of stuff which answers all your questions before you ask them. Same deal with exit preparation. So Headache Limited there, they, they found a buyer and they've just gone, you know, they've just gone, open the kimono, come in and have a look. <laughs> buyer, buyer comes in, starts finding skeletons in the closet, left, right and centre. Headache Limited is then reacting to those, off, you know, off trying to bat them away. Hasn't got time to consider its responses properly. <laughs> doesn't really understand the risks itself. Plain Sailing Limited has gone in itself, acted as if it were a buyer of its own business, found the skeletons, fixed the skeletons, mitigated the risks it can mitigate, and explained the rest. And again, it pre presents that to the buyer as, I know you're going to have doubts about this, this, and this. Here's why you shouldn't be worried about it, and this is what I've done to fix it. Again, preserving value by eroding away all the risks. <coughs> Next one, managing stakeholders. Similar to when, you, when I was talking about fundraising. When you come to sell, oops, sugar. When you come to sell, you're going to have various shareholders and various stakeholders. So, if, for example, you've got some employee shareholders who are not taking much out of the deal. They're worried about their jobs, maybe. Some angels that came in cheap and they came in early. So they're looking, they're going to make a really nice return on the exit. Perhaps you've got an institution that came in later at a higher price sold on a different growth story, maybe they were thinking, oh, we're going to get to IPO. They've got a different view of the exit. If you don't understand those priorities and those issues, surface them early and present them properly to the buyer, you'd be in trouble. So you, know, you get towards the end of a deal and last minute all your shareholders start kicking up. I'm not selling for that. I want this protection or that protection. Buyer gets spooked, impacts the value. And the last one, this is just, this is bit off because I, it's, I've just picked out a deal term randomly here, but the reason I've done it is earnouts and valuation problems we see a lot right now because of the way the market is. So this is where a buyer is saying, I think this business is worth 10 million pounds. Seller is saying, well, no, I think it's worth 15 million. So the solution is I'll pay you 10 million now and I'll pay you 5 million down the road depending on performance. 
And that's great, isn't it? It's logical because the seller gets the overall number it wants. The buyer only pays if the business turns out to be worth the 15 million. So not, and this happens all the time. But the problem with, we see with it is that you enter into the deal, you get a long way down the track with the, with the transaction, and then you, thank you, and then you find out, actually the way we're calculating the performance of the company means that as a seller, I don't actually think I can ever hit that target. And it's, we've now wasted a hell of a lot of time to get to that point, and they're quite complicated negotiations. And so it turns out, oh, I thought I was getting 15 million and it was realistic, but it turns out that in the detail, the devil's in the detail, and it turns out, no, I'm only going to get 10 million for my business, transaction falls over. It's happened quite a few times in quite a few transactions, so I thought I'd mention that. That brings us to the end and back to the start, which is simplicity and clarity in the legals means less doubt, fewer questions, which means greater focus on the positives and not on the risks, preserve the value, get your nice clean exit. Thank you. Actually, can we have a, can we have a, a mic for Alex as well here? So see, yeah, sorry, I can't even see him. Terrible. You're right. Yeah. Good. Um, lots of practical, sensible advice there. As someone who has both bought and sold businesses, I, I rather wish I'd had a lot of that before it entered either of those two processes. I just want to come to that very end point about earnouts. Do earnouts ever actually work for either side, let alone both? Yes, they do. I've seen them work. They're usually tortuous to mm. get to a point where everyone's happy with the, with the internet. The, the, if you think about what's happening there, you've got a seller that's handing over the business, so handing over control of the business, but then the performance of that business determines how much cash they get in the end. So they've got two years of maybe being involved or maybe not being involved at all and watching someone else determine their fate. So you, you've got a whole load of things you can argue about there. How much control does the seller have over that business in that period? Plus, you've got to work, as I was saying just now, you've got to work out how to calculate whether you've performed or not. And it seems simple, but when you get into it, it'll be you know, what is included in that calculation or not. And you need a, you'll have accountants crawling all over it, you'll have lawyers crawling all over it, and you'll end up. And you have operational carve-outs and the potential for friction from day one where the management team is doing that to max the earnout, the, the investor is doing whatever to not necessarily minimize because it wishes to be on a trajectory. I, I mean, do. I'm just wondering, but, but, on a, a blank, sorry, go on, you go. I was going to say, but, you shouldn't be scared of them either. There's mm. lots that work. I mean, I'm not mm. saying it's, a, it's a definitely a wrong thing to do. No, they're, they're, they're complex but can be extremely valuable. But it's, uh, as with all of this, it's going with eyes open, I guess. Um, what do you say, I'm sure there's different stages of entrepreneurs here. What do you say to those who say, you know what, uh, I just want to focus on running and growing and driving this business. I don't want all that complicated stuff or related. Um, I can't, we can't posit all the different scenarios. We've only just started. So how can we plan for an eventual exit when you know, it's so, so early stage? I say fair enough. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> Hang on, do you no, want to I take that question again? Let, let, me, let me rephrase. No, yeah. I understand, right? There's always going to be competing priorities. So you know, what, what you're thinking, oh, I can grow, I can create value by doing this. All I'm doing by spending money on legals is, is nothing. It's just creating a base. But as I was trying to say there, it's not that. The, the question is really, I'm creating value over here, but in not doing the legals, I'm eroding that value here. So the, the cost-benefit analysis is slightly different. It's not just this will make growth and this will do nothing. It's this will make growth and this will protect that growth. So you've got to see it in those terms. The other thing you need is for the advisors to understand that because the start, we, uh, <laughs> you know, to get a good and solid advice is expensive and the advisors need to realize which is what we're trying to do, is where this startup and scale up, which is cash constrained, we need to invest so that the fee's got to drop significantly. And that's, a, that's this law firm investing in the, in the startup, taking a bit of a punt. It'll be probably unprofitable, a lot of it, or marginally profitable, the law firm. But in the right sector with the right company, it's worth doing. So you need to find, really, a lawyer that will invest in you a little bit. Isn't one of the, um, the inherent problems that anyone selling faces is the, the asymmetry. On the whole, not always, on the whole, the seller is much smaller than the buyer. The buyer is much more experienced. They'll have done more acquisitions. They'll have you know, uh, senior legal teams, maybe in-house, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, it's a bit of a countercultural in-house, but anyway. Um, but they will, but you're, it's, it's not quite David against Goliath, but you have that gap. And that's the role of the advisor is to help try and bridge that gap, but to start with understanding the asymmetry. Yeah, that's totally correct. So... You know, your big private equity buyer comes in with 
from a, you know, you, let's say a big American law firm, aggressive style, you have to, you have, to have a team of advisors that can, can combat that. And that's not just on the legal side, it's also on the financial side. So you need corporate finance advice because a lot of the debate will be around, around the value. And so corporate finance advice will be crucial coming to exit. But the other thing to say, I suppose, is it doesn't mean you want somebody who's going to be, you know, bull in a china shop and create this adversarial process. These, these are transactions in the end, hmm. and it's supposed to, every side's supposed to, get some, supposed to be getting something out of it. So you need to choose the style of lawyer or person that you want, because it may be that not arguing over pointless things and creating this combat is not what you need, and you need someone who can smooth the process. So there's, a, there's, a, there's choices to be made. It, it, essentially, transactions don't stop when the last document is signed. It's a, it's a big stepping stone, but there is that relationship the other side. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure others would have experienced this. I certainly have, where lawyers in the past have been so aggressive, and it's the mano y mano, it's a very male thing in some mm. cases, um, that you look at, they're looking across the table at the other side, and that can screw a deal over. Have you, have you had experience of that? Not, not Burgess Salmon being like that, but where lawyers have got in the way of a deal. Yeah, I have. I have had experiences of that where there's been you know, really aggressive behaviour which is just counterproductive for everyone. And quite often it's, it's not focused on the points of real value as well. So one <laughs> of the sort of skills of a lawyer should be to know when something's not important enough and to just drop it because it's, it's just getting in the way. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. I mean, most law firms are good. The, the, one of the other problems you get is that s someone's using a very small law firm that's not experienced in, the, in an M&A deal, say. And then you tend to have arguments there which you wouldn't normally have because they don't really know what the market normally does. So it's not always that it's the big firm that's imposing itself. Sometimes it's the small firm that doesn't really understand that's asking questions that, that wouldn't normally be asked that causes an issue. So there's, a diff uh, there's another dynamic that sometimes plays out. I mean, so, so much of law is, is a matter of interpretation, a matter of negotiation, but also understanding the, uh, uh, the company uh, values and personalities. Let's uh, throw it open. Uh, either direct experience. Graham, yeah. Um, from your experience... Uh, do, you want, do you want to take the, take the mic? Because that's uh, just in case others may not hear this. Thanks. From your experience, is there a, a good time and a bad time to sell a company, or like, is it when there's an opportunity? Do you want to have reached your peak and got that, or where there's an opportunity of growth, or like, obviously it's bad to sell when you need it. So, that, I don't know. yeah, I, I'm really fact dependent. I think you know, there's the macroeconomics clearly, which is going to be a be a factor. But, but when it goes well, when there's a strong market, and you make the decision yourself, we're going to we're going to sell now. We're going to present the business at the right time. And we're going to run a process. We're going to Use, you'll, you'll apply a f employ a corporate finance person who will run an auction process for you, effectively. And we're going to do it now and generate all this competitive tension and create a wonderful exit. That, I suppose, would be the ideal. You've chose the moment, you've chosen it when the macroeconomics are right, and you've run this sort of linear process that hopefully creates competition and higher prices. But equally, it could be good if a strategic comes in at the right time because it's, it's a big corporate and it's in there you know, they need to do this at this moment because it's important for them strategically and that can generate a high price. Mm. So I don't think there's a real answer to that, Graham. I think the last thing you want is to be selling when you're desperate. Yeah. Can I, can I ask yeah, one yeah. more? Sure. Um, if, if you were choosing to sell, what would be the first thing that you'd do? Other than beat a path to Burgess Salmon, purely for example. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, it, wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be a lawyer, first off. It would be, I'd be talking to corporate finance advisors and working out how, how I put together a, a valuation for the company and then how I present that to maximise the price. And, and related to that, how, uh, in, in headline terms, how's, how is it different if it's an IPO that's being considered about the, the preparation that's needed for that to become a public company? It's even, you, get a, you get due diligence on any M&A deal, so if it's a private company buying you, you're going to have to go through this rigorous due diligence process. They'll ask you a thousand questions, you'll spend loads of time answering it. On an IPO, it's even more rigorous, so you're gonna, everything's going to be verified to the nth degree, so it's, it's very significant time and, and will to, to get through to an IPO, even more so than a private M&A deal. Thanks, uh, and thank you, Graham. Uh, some more questions, please. Yeah, do I again say uh, your, your organisation name, please? Yeah. yeah Dad. Yeah. Um, tell us what Deadlineology is or does, by the way, for those who may not know. It uh, seeks to make uh, micro businesses in more investable oh. from a client point of view, but also from uh, an owner point of view and a supplier point of view. Right. And the question I have is really to what extent should you think about selling your business? whilst you still want to be in it, rather than to leave it? 
well, if you need if you need an injection of capital that's going to take you to the next level, I suppose in that in the scenario you're talking about, you're looking at a private equity investment of some kind, which which will involve the investor coming in, acquiring the company, but requiring the sellers or some of the sellers, the managers, to reinvest a portion of their proceeds. So you end up you're a seller and you're also an investor. So post deal, you're in you're in the acquisition structure, in the buy side structure, alongside the private equity firm. That can be great for management teams if done correctly because you've, you've then got a stake in the business going forward. It's supercharged because it's got all this investment from the private equity wing and then you're benefiting in that, in that growth. So if you've got a good deal from a good fund that makes sense and will provide you with the capital that you need to grow that equity and the structure's right because remember your shares there are gonna rank below probably the private equity house. Yeah, as long as you realize that if you achieve the business plan that ranking will allow you to achieve the right amount of money that you want and is structured well and you've taken good advice, that can be a fabulous opportunity. So tell us about a, a, another route, which is uh, EOTs, those who don't know, Employee Ownership Trusts, and what that... Oh, is this, is this a bad thing? Well, I don't know what <laughs> I'm talking about, Greg. So, yeah, it could be. Well, come on, basket man. <laughs> um, but in terms of the, the preparation that's required from a legal point of view to enable a company to be able to sell its company to a management team. In, oh, oh, selling just to a, is this a normal management buyer? Are you talking about a fully a, employee a, owned? A, probably a fully in, uh, the EOT structure is. Well, I don't know to, I've never done a deal which you sell to a fully employee owned company, right. so I can't talk too much about it, but the process will be similar mm. to any, I suppose. The difference will be that those employees that are going to end up as owners of the business should understand it already for a start, and so they should be well aware of the issues. And so the, I'd imagine that the diligence process that would happen on with the third party buyer would be much reduced. It also means that those employees are going to get full access to all the information about the company that they may not have had previously. <laughs> so I imagine that can cause a couple of um, issues. But beyond that, Greg, I, I don't, I'm not really qualified to, to talk about that one. That's fair. I, I actually think that's the, that's the better answer to say, well, you know, I, I don't know in full detail, but this is the outline. So very good. Um, last question, if I may. Or if I may not, if I may not. Um, so I want to come back to this point about, uh, which is touched on about the time to sell. So we've got a time at the moment of, of high inflation, uh, post-COVID recovery, interest rates, maybe someone knows already, interest rates went up this morning, quarter a point, half a point, they're going up. They've gone up, they're bad. Uh, 11 rises in 18 months or whatever. Is this a better time to be a buyer or a seller per se? Oh, it's difficult. The, the, if, if it's, if the on the buy side, you're using debt. You know, if it's a leveraged buyout of some kind, then that debt's more expensive. So that's a problem on the buy side. Well, it's a problem for everybody, but a problem on the buy side. On the sell side, the, you know, the university, universe, universe of buyers will be reduced. There's going to be pressure on pricing at the moment, so you're going to end up potentially with these sort of earn-out mechanisms and this complication and less competitive tension. So I, I don't think it's, you know, you know, there's all sorts of pressures. On the other hand, when you go to these conferences and things, they talk about what the market's like, and, and the messaging I'm seeming to get is, it's hard, the processes are taking longer, the valuations are fought over more, but there's still buyers out there. The funds have managed to raise money, so they're, you know, there's all the private equity money's there. There's a lot of capital available. out there yeah, not, not being there. used, yeah. So it's not all doom and gloom by any means. I just think it's, it's tightening, terms are tightening, processes are taking longer, and then you get it depends on the sector though, doesn't it? Because it's all sort of anecdotal, but we've got one at the moment, for example, it's, it's a defense company. I can't give you too much detail about it, but it's, it's benefiting from the fact that lots of people are building lots of things and sending them to Ukraine and then replenishing their own resources. So that company in this market's pulled out of a sale process, not because uh, it's, it's been hard, but because the valuation that it put on there initially is now way, way, way too low. So it's relaunching with a new, uh, I am an information memorandum with a much higher price in it. So in certain subsectors, you'll get massive booms. So it's hard to generalize. Okay. And on a purely personal basis, do you prefer to act for a buyer or a seller? Seller. <laughs> in one. <laughs> well, stop. <laughs> Why so? Uh, both, really. But seller's nice, isn't it? Because especially if it's, a, if it's an entrepreneur that's built something and it's, you know, it's really important to them and you, you, you like them and you want to you know, protect them and serve them properly, that's more rewarding. It's also stressy because for me, you know, I'm going to do them all the time. 
for this person it's like an emotional crescendo. Yeah. It's like the, it's the fulfillment of all of their business, you know, the whole life of, of building this thing and they're gonna sell it. So they, and I can't reach that peak all the time because you'd be doing it every couple of weeks. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd pass out. So it's straining, but it's, that's, that's the more rewarding one, Greg. Well, there we are. Um, a, a lot of practical advice. Uh, it's also some insight in what it is like from, from a personal point of view to, to run processes, to help management teams, founders, uh, entrepreneurs, and so on through that exit process. One of the key messages clearly is whenever you think it might be the time to start, it should probably have started a bit earlier than that. Process always starts early. If you can get your companies into the maximum robust position so that a buyer subsequently can't chip price because you haven't got uh, all the requisite uh, 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 documentation, IP rights, management structures. And I think one of the other things that came out, uh, for me uh, at least, was that I'll just extrapolate a point you said, which is that, of course, the focus as a seller is always going to be on the sale price, but the sale value, so much of that, is based on taxation and tax advice and structuring. So again, it means go early in getting your, your structures right such that you can exit to the best personal value subsequently. Uh, on your behalf, uh, thank you very much to Alex Lloyd and to Burgess Sachs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.